Well, welcome to all of you, um, and thank you for joining the panel to talk about technology and design. And one of the key themes that's emerged this morning has been the interface or interaction between technology, design, between computers and art, the breaking down of many of the silos that have been so present in the educational system and how we've looked at the world in recent years. And all of you are on the cutting edge of breaking down silos. Um, but I'd like to perhaps start with Nicholas Negroponte from MIT. You started life as an architect. You then went on to co-found the MIT Media Lab, which is very much trying to bring together the different aspects of computers, design, and art. When you look at the future right now and you look at the extraordinary capabilities of technology, are you feeling optimistic that that's going to make our lives better? And how does that interplay with design? Let me ask you a question. Do I get four minutes to say something or do I have to answer that? Because what I would like to do is start a little bit personally and talk about fried eggs and omelets. And the world has been a fried egg when we were born and it's become an omelet. And that's the consequence of being digital. And the story I wanted to tell you is that when I went to school, I always won all the art prizes. Always. I even got my headmaster to allow me to do art instead of sports, because I thought sports were stupid. But for some reason, I got an 800 in my math, which in American lingo is a perfect score. And so I decided I should study architecture, because that was art and math. And I went to the headmaster and I said to him, you know, did well in art, did well in math, so I'm going to go to architecture. He said something to me so profound that I missed it for a decade. <laughs> he said, I like gray suits and I like pinstripe suits, but I hate gray pinstripe suits. And I thought, huh? You don't like gray pinstripe suits. I went to architecture school anyway. And while I was in architecture school, I realized that computers with what I was really into, and that that was where technology and design met. And then I thought to myself, I actually sat back and I thought to myself, how do I have an impact? on the world and in architecture, do I have to become a Frank Lloyd Wright or whatever, which I was probably not going to become. But if I designed the tools for them, I'd have a big impact. And so I spent 50 years doing that, building the media lab, building other things. And something has happened during those 50 years. And this is the point I'd like to see if others share, and that is we have been able to go smaller and smaller and smaller in scale. We can engineer genes. We can, en we can get right down to the atomic level. And suddenly, the building tools are not bricks. They are not concrete. What you saw in the keynote address, in some sense, is the end of constructing things out of components. Because we will be able to do what nature did. We will design buildings by planting a seed in the ground, and it'll grow. It will not be additive. It will come from the bottom up. And that is because we went from fried eggs to omelets. And your life today is an omelet. You used to go to work, then you used to come home. There was home life, work life. You used to be part of a group or not part of a group, part of a race, not part of a race, part of a country, not part of a country. And all those things are changing. So the two things is one, 
we are going to do as well and perhaps better than nature by growing things. And two, that omelet's a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. And think of all the things you can do with omelets mm -hmm. that you can't do with fried eggs. <laughs> okay, so Four customized minutes. and mixed up. Okay, that's a very optimistic perspective. I'm going to ask Neri in a minute for her view because she's also working at the MIT Media Lab in a very interesting cutting edge um, part of the MIT Media Lab. But before I do, I'd like to ask Neil. Neil, you sit now in Silicon Valley, but you have been writing about the sweep of history, um, all the good bits and particularly the bad bits in recent centuries, and looking at how technology has developed. Do you feel as optimistic about design and about the omelets? Well, there are other things you can do with eggs. <laughs> And as an historian who has no other qualification for being on this panel than that I've studied uh, the history of, of technology, I can't help but remind the techno-optimists in the room of one of the things that you can do with an egg, because it happened uh, to me uh, yesterday as uh, I was on my way uh, to uh, the uh, reception, at the glorious and spectacular uh, Foster Foundation, an egg was thrown at our car, making rather a mess of the nice Tesla uh, that we were in. And it was thrown, as far as we could work out, uh, by a Madrid cab driver as part of the protest that is ongoing here uh, over the disruption of transportation by Uber. Now, I listened to the keynote, brilliant as it was, uh, by Matthias Kohler, and as an historian, I felt mounting dread. <laughs> Man watching robots, drone bricklayers, a kind of Jenga towers being constructed in the middle of nowhere in France. And I, I thought to myself, when does the backlash against technology begin? Uh, last year, we saw the backlash, the populist backlash, directed mostly against globalization. Uh, it is going to be directed against technology uh, when middle America and middle Europe figure out that it's the technology that really threatens traditional manufacturing jobs. I was really heartened to hear Johnny Ives say, we make tools for people. Uh, I worry that we're increasingly going to be making people for tools. And at some point, history tells us uh, the people uh, push back against really disruptive technological change. And although they often lose, uh, the pushback can produce enormous upheavals. I want to make two very brief points, Julian, and then mm -hmm. hand it back to the experts here. I, I think, and I I've really been struck by it living in uh, California, the people who work in this domain are terrifyingly historically ignorant. Uh, the Silicon Valley Titans, in, in their euphoria at the prospect of replacing all drivers uh, with self-driving cars, only ask the question, how much basic income should we pay these people once we've made them redundant? They don't really ask the question, how have people in the past behaved in response to technological disruption? So here are my two points. Number one. Major technological innovation always has unforeseen consequences. Whatever it is that you're creating will turn out to have a different use from what you expected, and it may not be very nice. The printing press wasn't designed to destroy the Roman Catholic Church's monopoly uh, on Western Europe, uh, but that's what it did, and it unleashed waves of disruption, religious and other civil wars for a period of at least two centuries. Railroads were not supposed to transport armies to uh, the front lines, but that's what they did in 1914. And I could go on. Second point, to an extent that we never want to admit, most of the technological innovation of the last millennium was propelled uh, by conflict, not by uh, philosopher designers uh, sitting in elegant uh, white painted studios. 
And we need to recognize that even the internet had its origins in a Department of Defense uh, program. Uh, even Silicon Valley itself came into existence partly because of a symbiotic relationship with what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. Now, I am therefore, in my Glaswegian role as the voice of doom, here to say <laughs> that this bright and shiny future of drone bricklayers and men watching robots will not be as bright and shiny as you think, and the rotten eggs have only just begun flying. <laughs> Well, as someone who is trained in social science myself, I always like to hear a historian plugging his craft. And I'm sure if anyone needs to hire a good historian, they can find one very easily. But um, Neri, I'd like to ask you, because you have been trying to bring together technology and design and art um, in a very innovative way. Um, you talk about the fact that we need to move from consuming nature as a society to editing nature to mothering nature and trying to work with nature, um, not in a conflict-soaked way, but in a more symbiotic way. I mean, how do you interpret what Nicholas and Neil are saying, the two opposing views there? Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me. And second of all, I apologize because I believe I'm the only one on the panel who has a couple of slides. Um, and I feel uncomfortable showing them, knowing that others oh. don't have the same opportunity. However, um, this will probably help explain uh, what Nicholas meant. Um, so, uh, if possible, could you run this same slide over and over, just loop it con constantly, uh, which is what it was designed to do. Um, so, if you loop, if you replay that slide, um, <laughs> this is called creating anticipation imagine, and suspense. Imagine. <laughs> um, and you saw what was on the screen. Let's assume you can imagine it's still there. Do you have any idea what that was? I'm just curious if the audience has any idea of what they were looking at. Brain. Any other ideas? Brain is good. A seed, anything else? I thought it was a raindrop, actually. So, so it's true. Most people, when they look at these kind of images, um, think it is a biological artifact or a biological object. But in fact, it is entirely designed. Um, so every voxel on this screen, every three-dimensional pixel, has been designed from scratch. Um, to create the next slide, which is... This is the challenge of technology, yes. Which is a set of death masks um, that are designed to contain life. Um, so what you saw in the first slide is basically an MRI-like representation of the object, but in extremely high resolution, um, and that resolution approaches the resolution of nature. So these objects were printed in 16 micron voxel resolution, which is the resolution of human hair, um, and are approaching the resolution of a red blood cell, a sperm cell, a muscle cell, a nerve cell axon. And that's a very exciting moment in design because designers are moving from an age where we're simply designing the shape or the form of an object to designing its properties and its behavior in the resolution that matches its use, whether it's a wearable for the body that can scan the body and contain sweat or generate vitamins or melanin, um, or whether it's a building skin that can sequester carbon or uh, harness solar energy. Um, and so, I'm fascinated by um, this uh, ability to integrate between all things that are material and synthetic and all things that are natural. Um, but I'm curious, because you've, done, you've used 3D printing to create these amazing things like death masks. 
but you're also starting to use 3D printing to experiment with, say, printing the bare bones of a building. You're essentially bringing in AI, you're bringing in robotics to start replacing, if you like, some of the traditional work of a designer, architect, construction expert. Are you at all concerned about the type of backlash that Neil was pointing to? No. <laughs> you should <clears throat> No. <laughs> okay, Neil, you're officially outvoted. Mark. It's a long history of this sort of thing, and some of us do know something about history. And when, when the agrarian society, which represented whatever 90% of all employment, uh, went to representing something like 1% or 2% today, uh, people had the same comments. And uh, Plato even was against writing. There are people that were against all sorts of things uh, in the course of history. And you know, right now, the emphasis on jobs comes from a very narrow view of what a job is. In fact, jobs as we know them today are relatively new. I mean, if you think back 150 years, a lot of people didn't have jobs as we know them today. So what do people do? And the answer is people do what, if they're lucky, they're good at and they love doing. Now that's a very elite point of view, probably applies to most people in this room. But wouldn't a wonderful target be that everybody does that? And that we create a world of that sort of thing. And maybe that world is different. Maybe that world is you don't think of kindergarten through 12th grade, you think of kindergarten through 25th grade. Maybe you think of other things that make our point of view about work different. And our point of view about maybe guaranteed minimum incomes will take off in one way or something. But there are other ways than just looking at that job you don't want people driving cars. I don't care how many eggs. It's not safe. You don't want humans driving cars. QED period. Okay, you just don't. And you want them to park automatically. You don't want them to be stored in somebody's garage. You don't want them to do all the things. 35% of most of the traffic in cities is looking for a parking space. Give me a break. That's ridiculous. So self-driving cars are not just a fact of life, is an important fact of life. It's going to change the shape of cities as much as elevators changed the shape of cities. And I'm but, sure there were people against elevators when they were invented because they'll say, well, we're not getting enough exercise. People should walk up seven and well, elevators are a bad there idea. There weren't as many elevator operators yeah. as there are truck drivers in America today. I mean, mm -hmm. truck driving is the biggest single um, occupation for uh, middle class, for working class men right now. But um, Mark and Patricia, I'd like to bring you both in um, because you sat here patiently um, and ask you, I mean, how optimistic are you about the way that technology is changing the role of designers and architects like yourself. Mark, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, well, I suppose it depends what you mean by optimistic. I think, uh, as has been already um, described, I think to a large degree for people like me, for designers, uh, the kinds of technologies that we've spoken about are tools at this moment in time. I don't think anyone would disagree with the fact that you know, there's no, you know, it's going to be a very, very, very long time before artificial intelligence could replicate the skills that an artist, for example, uh, demonstrates. You know, and part of what we do, part of what I do, um, is, is, in a sense, being an artist, I suppose. You know, we're not just engineers. You know, there's a, there's a degree of, of, of uh, well, hopefully, a degree of creativity. <laughs> um, and, and that's the part, you know, that, that, I, that I think will be very, very difficult to, to replicate artificially. Although I don't fundamentally and philosophically have a problem with the prospect that it could, it could happen. 
but I think, uh, you know, as I say, on a fundamental level, um, these technologies, however compelling, are tools. Um, and at this moment in time, they need to be operated. I mean, as Nicholas, I think, has sort of alluded to, um, people probably at some point in time complained about having a hammer or having a saw. Uh, and, you know, now we're, you know, frustrated with, with things that are just far more capable. But ultimately they're tools. They're right. things that enable us uh, to do what we do in a more efficient and a more accurate right. way. But we need to still be able to operate those tools. I mean, do you see, before I turn to Patricia, and I'll ask you the same question, Patricia, in a minute, but do you see your role as a designer being to soften or humanize some of this technology so that people can relate to a more technological world in a better way? You seem to me. Yes, either of you, either Mark or Patricia. Well, I think, uh, I don't know, a uh, lot. First, I think, uh, to just give an answer, what for me is difficult is to speak, uh, thinking about one future. I call, I, there's no one future. We have in front of us many futures, and we have to understand this, and I think especially the young people here, because we are going to, when we're thinking about future, it's, it's about futures, and futures are already connected with what we are living today. And all the fear, all the problems we see, all the, this umbrella, um, problematic umbrella, lives with the other umbrella, which is the one of uh, uh, searching utopias in some way, you know? And uh, I think, for example, here we have with Negro, Negro Ponte, and Neri, uh, two persons from MIT, doing uh, incredible research, and I think they, 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 they have very clear already that part of the utopias we have in front of us, we can call them even not utopias, because utopia is a no place, but it's like a limit that is always moving, and then makes you move, and then moving, uh, you get alive. Then it's something good in some way. But utopia, which is a, a nearby mm, word, and this good place uh, means that already they got that research. And what they are saying, and I think could be comunque interesting, and very interesting, for me it's very interesting, is because they, they think even digital is a frontier, and it's a frontier very interesting. It's a very interesting frontier for architecture. I, I was so happy to listen to you. Uh, because in some way, in architecture, we have to, to move to the digital drawing, to the digital doing, Michael. But in any case, you have very clear already that the passage is not digital, it's to uh, biotech. And biotech means we possibly um, getting on that kind of, of thinking, we can get on a kind of rhizoma, which is not easy argument because his omelette. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy because it's a most rhizomatic. It's not the egg as I've been educated in a humanistic way. My egg, huevo frito, I'm a Spanish. I think I'm only Sp Spanish in all these conversations. <laughs> but me huevo frito, I capito. Was comunque, you have the, 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 the yellow, I can't, you have everything was working and you could move it, I capito. But um, those are scramble eggs, I call that frittata. Ay, ay, ay. It's, it's, it's not so, no. I think it's not so easy um, to understand, but I think it's one, they are speaking about one of the most interesting frontier we have in front, but we have a lot of them. Then if, and I would like to say the other two things. Then in this case, I think uh, they, if we, we approach projects and I think now they are the best universities 
trying to do this, but there are people in London. I, I, I see a few person, different personages working on this. Even in Biennale uh, in Istanbul of, of design, there were some personages working on this argument. And uh, biotech will be interesting because in some way, um, artificio in natura, something that Gillo Dorfles, I come from the from a school which is Italian, Angelo Dorfles is still alive, then I think he's biotech him by, by himself, 107 years old. Echo, he was saying, artificio e natura, echo, is a, that is the question, the, the question. And they are speaking another time about that. And possibly, I, I think, is the one the most interesting for them. Then I keep them protected, echo. I, I, I don't know, with my kind of umbrella, I'm gonna try to do it. But I, me, Patricia, I'm Spanish, I study in Madrid, but I, as many creatives, at a certain moment I needed to, to go out of my comfort zone. Claro. Then you go right. out of it. Well, we have here Mark Newson, that I think is fantastic, coming from Australia, and he arrived so young, with so clear ideas, so uh, curious, and so simplifying process of looking items that he did a magnificent work, but he knew how to navigate quite, quite right. young, coming from far away. Right. I moved from Italia. I arrived to Italia as a student, and I've ended my studies in a university interdisciplinary. That is fantastic. That stupid university in Milano for those years was with five, uh, 1,500 students. Ridiculous. Then it was yeah, already, already right. a rhizoma. Then they were doing scenography, architecture, design, uh, city. Then they were doing everything. Because there was uh, all the political problems before, then this faculty became the chaos. Well, not chaos. For me, it was fantastic. It was not a chaos, because it was interdisciplinary. Then me, I became a designer, an architect, a scenographer, many things at the same time. Right. I, this university ended. Now it's divided. Then they destroyed another time. That's so it's opinion. back to the point. Then we have to come back, Echo, to, <laughs> to, to, to all these things. Then I, you go on. I can so. tell all the things. That's well, so the problem back. of designers. We are interested of everything. Well, that ties in very well with the key theme of the morning, which is about the need to break down different silos. I mean, that's a point that I'm completely... Um, fascinated by, to the point where I actually wrote a book about it last year. But as Mayor Bloomberg says earlier on, breaking down silos is crucial in education and in many jobs. But I'm just curious, I'd like to come back to the split we have on the panel. I think we're currently, in terms of the optimist pessimist, about three and a half to one, the one being Professor Ferguson at the end. Um, and I'm just curious, I'd like to ask the audience right now, how many of you in the room feel optimistic about the potential of technology to make our societies better? And how many feel pessimistic? All the optimists raise their, raise their hands. Okay, and the pessimists? Yeah. Double-edged sword, okay, or trick but question. It's always just, a, just checking whether you're actually awake or not. Um, we are gonna break for lunch in about five minutes, but, um, so Neil, I think you are officially outnumbered here. As always. That doesn't mean I'm wrong, though. <laughs> it's, it's worth making one point of clarification because I think Nicholas may have misunderstood me. It, the, the issue here is not just the problem of, of the backlash. The tendency on the part of innovators is to say resistance is futile. I think this is the secret motto of Uber. You know, our technology is so awesome <laughs> Any attempt to stop it is doomed to fail, so you may as well just put your hands up. And, and I think one clear lesson of history is that even when resistance is futile, people resist. If you haven't read Dostoevsky's notes from underground, shame on you, but you should read it. <laughs> I won't do a show of hands because I don't want to embarrass anybody in this highly cultured city. But 
Dostoevsky, in the, in writing in the mid-19th century, said, the utilitarians imagine a world in which every human action will be governed by timetable, and all that we are going to do will be predicted uh, with, uh, with, t with precision and accuracy, which is very much the mentality in Silicon Valley these days. Um, and Dostoevsky's point is that we will reserve the right to be stupid even in the face of highly sophisticated rationality. And I think Dostoevsky was entirely vindicated by everything that happened in Russia and indeed the world after he wrote those words. So number one, there will be a, a futile backlash and it will be larger than you think even if it's ultimately defeated by the technology. But the second point is, and it's in many ways more important, do not forget that your brilliant inventions will be misused. Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein didn't sit down and ask themselves, how can we design an atomic bomb? But that's what happened. And almost all the innovations that we talk that about happened. today, well, I could give you a very long list, Nicholas, mm -hmm. uh, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the great innovations either were inspired by conflict or came to be used for conflict. And this will be true of drones, too. Those drones looked nice, didn't they, delivering the bricks into the Jenga tower? But there are other things that drones will de deliver, and soon. And they'll be explosive devices. So I think we all are in grave danger of succumbing to the Silicon Valley propaganda that everything is awesome and resistance is futile. I think I will be in a minority for arguing this now, and 10 years from now, you'll all agree with me. <laughs> I can see that Nicholas is dying to get back, it's, it's and I see, but also, Mark yeah. has barely said, a, had, has yeah. not really had a lot of time. Mark, so, do you have a couple of things you want to say, and then I'll let Nicholas reply. Yeah, it's, it's, oh, just Mark. the word, just, <laughs> just the use of the word resistance, as if it were the resistance against the Nazis, or resistance, a resistance of one, is unto itself a very telling word. Um, one of the founders of the Media Lab who founded it with me was the inventor, literally the inventor of the field of artificial intelligence. He just died this year, his name is Marvin Minsky. And Marvin coined the term and founded the field. And I was very fortunate because he was a friend, a dear friend. We cooked together, we were neighbors, we spent a lot of time. And in the 1960s, what were Marvin and his friends talking about? They weren't talking about self-driving cars and robotics and all of that stuff. They were talking about humor. Yeah. They were talking about why do humans appreciate music? They wanted to understand the brain. And they divided themselves into the wets and the dries. The wets, people like Jerry Letvin, took the brain apart, looked at it, and the dries looked at behavior. And there is no question in my mind that 30 years from now, people will learn French by swallowing a pill. <laughs> that pill will go into your bloodstream and deliver French to the right part of your brain so that you can use it now, if that doesn't blow you away and you say, well, maybe that's not the right thing because you should learn French this way. There right. are things to come that make Uber look like child's play. I mean, this is child's play. So if we're against self-driving cars, we got a much bigger problem ahead. And I don't see how you can be against self-driving cars. It's safer. It's like a gun license. Okay. All right. Okay. I don't want to get. I want to have Mark. Mark to have a word here because I think you know we need to hear from the designer here because okay. we are essentially at a design conference. Mark. Was I the half in the three and a half? Or, <laughs> or, well, I'm a sort of a glass half empty kind of guy, uh, unfortunately. But I don't have any slides with me. But I'd like to give one sort of practical example of an object. I mean, people always ask me, you know, what's the favorite, it's a completely inane question, one that I get really sick and tired of answering, you know, what's the favorite thing that you've designed? Because I've designed all sorts of different things. And I always try and dodge the question. But just by pure coincidence, I happen to have brought one of the favorite things that I've designed. And it's a pen. Not a soap dispenser. Not a soap dispenser. And it's one of the objects that I think, well, I'd like to, imagine that all of us uh, love using a pen still. 
you know, it's not only a pen. I mean, it's a, it's an, it's a pen that has ink inside it, you know, like it's a fountain pen on top of that. Um, and I, I just think it's a sort of a, uh, you know, it's a sort of practical example of, 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 a, of an analog tool that still enables people like us to sort of do what we do. It's still the most, it's still the most coherent and speedy link between, you know, what's going on up here and what's happening out there. I mean, it may not always be like that, clearly. But, but I enjoy that, that you know, that, that process. And I'm not sure I could say the same thing about uh, doing it digitally right now. Right. OK, well, I think that makes you a half, three and a half to one. But I think it's two now. I think we're, it, the pen is mightier than the drone, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, I would love to carry on all morning. We can't because we do have lunch now. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. I take away sort of three key points. Firstly, that obviously technology or technological change is accelerating in a way that is going to remake the world to quite an extraordinary degree. Secondly, opinions about whether that is good or bad remain divided. But thirdly, the one thing that is absolutely clear that everyone agrees on is that the only way we can respond to this technological change is to rethink a lot of our traditional silos about the split between arts and science, computing and design in more innovative ways. And I think last but not least, as a result of this panel, we're never going to look at an egg quite the same way again. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>